Welcome to, to the Cube Pod episode 75. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante on the road again. Dave, you're in South Carolina. I'm in Seattle. Hey, Great yeah. to see you. Um, to see what, you a, man. what a what a historic week it's been. Um, just a lot going on. I, on uh, this week, we interviewed. Um, we did the Vast Data event. We had. Um, I interviewed Amazon's leader and the partner network, Ruba Vorna, and then we went to any scale event, uh, hot growing startup, and of course, Seattle had this huge. Uh, intelligent applications 40 awards winners a summit which had all the big players there and then obviously uh, one of the keynotes was brad gerster who was one of the investors in the most historic funding round in the history of venture capital open ai raised so much cash it's almost mind-blowing i mean essentially called it an ipo and essentially it's bigger than valuation than most ipos in the history of tech so, you know, just tons of things to talk about. Uh, open AI will dominate, I think, our conversation because I got a lot yep. of opinions on this. I know you do too. There's just a yep. lot of different storylines, right, on, on open AI. And then, of course, I mean, it's just besides the open AI craziness as the biggest VC, VC round ever, um, you know, questions around burn rate, cost increases versus revenue. When does the business model kick in? The magic of the experience. Is that really a judge for their competitive sustainability, their moat, as some say? Um, Cerebris just filed an IPO. They're becoming an NVIDIA rival. So it's NVIDIA's role in all this AI madness. Um, and then VCs are struggling as they start to see portfolio companies not making it on um, traction the way they wanted it to. So you know, there's a little bit of a bubblicious mentality right now. In turn, was in the market with open AI, the big players, and then there's a what's developing a have and have nots market for AI. And then, you know, with all that optimism and bubblicious, you know, funding and momentum, there's still the AI safety and the AI ethics, the AI governance, the AI risk management uh, happening. So, you know, um, Gavin Newsom, Newsom um, you know, making AI a political hot potato that's on Silicon Angle. And then obviously coding assistance, poolside raised 500 million. Um, Google has this new thing I've been playing with around, um, you know, um, uh, Notebook LM, which is essentially a voice active. It takes documents and turns them into podcasts. So we could literally create like an NPR style podcast from any file. I uploaded one of our meetings and Zoom meetings and listen, make a, write a story about this. And it was just hilarious. It was just like two people talk. Oh, yeah. it's just it's just a it's really incredible the role of voice. So a lot of things to point to in AI that's that's interesting polit uh, politically, technology, but there's still the cultural piece of it. And again, finally, on a more in the weeds um, comment, uh, vast data cosmos event, which we streamed on Silicon Angle in the Cube. Had the founders Jeff Des, uh, Desmore was in with Denworth. me, yeah, Jeff Denworth, um, Denworth, he's the Doors drummer. Um, uh, Jeff came on. We did a great one-on-one. -on -one. You did an analyst panel. They streamed Jensen uh, uh, Wong from Nvidia on, the, on our on our on our platform in the show. They had um, J two from Cisco. So you know, vast data kind of cornering the storage AI market data with the data platform. So again, all that's going on. And then just tons of like other news that's got buried. I mean, go to Silicon Angle, you'll see everything there. But, um, you know, we had the New York Stock Exchange event we streamed yesterday. That was the media week as part of climate week. So there's so much disruption going on on both the front end application side, as well as the back end. Again, we've been chronicalizing it on the cube. Um, it's mind blowing. It's it's head spinning. It really is the tale of of this generation. <laughs> and and then we had the vice presidential debate too this week, which we really don't talk politics much, but uh, at least it yeah. Was I mean, similar. I thought I, I thought that was one big deep fake uh, episode. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> what am I watching? <laughs> like, what is right. this? There's yeah, so. Thank you, Tim. Politics. I was like, yeah, okay. Very simple. I, could, I agree with him. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, let's get into the open AI. That's the top yeah. conversation. I mean, well, everything points to the, to the wave of AI. And, and, you know, all that news I just read, again, all happened this week. And this, it was more, tons more. But it all points to um, what is now becoming a generational shift that we've been chronicalizing on the Cube. Dave, this is um, historic funding. It's a historic company. 
just some stats on OpenAI that Brad Gerster put up in, the, in his fireside chat. Person, person, when I saw him with the at Madrona event, was you know if you look at how fast they got to a billion dollars in revenue faster than Facebook and Google, um, the uh, IPO numbers of Facebook and Google were both around twelve times revenue. That's in line where where OpenAI is today. And so the question is, will this be a trillion dollar company? And the answer is probably going to be yes if they continue. And again, if you remember, I think at episode two or three or 10, I kept early pod, we were discussing, does open AI have a moat? Will they be the winner? And I think Howie Shu said, it's only 100 million to replicate. He was wrong, right? So you're going to need more than that. And then what does open AI do to maintain their competitive position? Do they have to build their own cloud? So there's so many dimensions to this, right? Is it a good investment? Uh, uh, um, are the cards on the table, the cards that are really going to drive the future? What cards will come out next on the table? And do yeah. guys like Brad Gerster actually have the foresight to be smart and have vision? Uh, I question that. So again, all of this is on the table. So let's let's break down the numbers. They raised six point six billion, which, like you said, that's a, that's an IPO. Uh, but that's the biggest raise, I guess, in the history of VC. I think the previous record was Elon raised six billion uh, for XAI, uh, and their valuation went from eighty-six billion. Remember, uh, insiders sold, employees sold, and got liquid. That was an eighty-six billion dollar valuation. Now it's up to one hundred and fifty-seven billion. So that's more than Uber. It's more than Goldman. I mean, it's just more than AT and T. I think. And which is astounding. I think uh, Thrive Capital led it, right? With like what, 1.2 billion, John? And then Microsoft, I think, put in almost a billion. And then a number of, I think, Vinod, they, everybody wanted their pro rata, you know, to keep their, you know, relative proportions, not get washed out. I think, I think Gerstner or Altimeter put in 250 million. I read somewhere that you, the minimum amount to see the financials was 250 million. Can you imagine? You got to put in 250 million. If you want to see the numbers, I think I read that right. And then the other thing, it was quite weird because they had two, they have two years to achieve, you know, for-profit status going from nonprofit to profit. We could talk about that. And then if they don't achieve it, uh, supposedly the investors can get their money back, which makes, I don't know how that's going to work. The money's going to be gone. So I don't know how it works. And then of course um, th there were other terms that they weren't allowing the investors to invest in other competitors, namely Ilya's company and Anthropic. And so I know I tweeted, I know one individual investor, i.e. <laughs> Jensen, who has some leverage over that clause uh, because he's got all the GPUs. And I would say this, if, if I may just take a second. So people are like, wow, this is unbelievable. But I am not surprised at all. If you believe that this is the biggest wave in the history of tech waves, which everybody does right or wrong it's bigger than pcs bigger than the internet bigger than cloud bigger than mobile if that's the case then you would expect that you would have a raise like this that's bigger than anything we've ever seen before so that's sort of point number one i think my second point on this is we're seeing that sam altman who comes across as this just nice guy is a total alpha <laughs> he got kicked out he got his company back he got rid of the people that he didn't want on the board. He's shaking out, you know, people are leaving left and right. He's bringing in his own team. He's raising a ton of money. Uh, he's a major player in the industry. So he is really asserting himself as a, a, just a really, you know, major shark in this whole equation. And um, I think this, this transitioning from a nonprofit to a for-profit is got to be a very complicated matter. I mean, John, you know, just even simple, you know, changing from, uh, you know, a C-Corp to an S-Corp or vice versa is a very complicated matter. Can you imagine going from a nonprofit that has raised multiple billions of dollars with all kinds of, you know, investors and, and investors that get a right to future profits and but don't get the AGI. I mean, all kinds of convoluted tripwires in those original agreements. You got to unwind that and recap the whole thing. And then the last thing I'll say is I got to bring in LenaCon because right here now they're going after Microsoft, they're going after Google, they're going after Amazon, they're going after Apple. Just when the new wave is starting, okay, OpenAI is. 
representative of the new wave. So yet again, the government's a decade late uh, and is going to waste a bunch of time and money to get nothing accomplished. And so this is the new wave. We're seeing it, whether or not open AI is, you know, ascends to to what people think they will be or what they aspire to be remains to be seen. And we can talk about that. But the point is, whether it's open AI or somebody else, this is we are in the new wave, John. Yeah, I mean, I would also add to that complicated Sam Altman dance, as you call it, alpha dance. Um, maybe it could be a song around that. But, you know, he's also not well liked in some circles because of the, the, the feathers he's ruffled. But he was doing it on top of a massively highly accelerated change transformation. You mentioned open AI. One, the product was growing like a weed. You had the, uh, the staff um, turnover. You had the corporate structure um, uh, hanging around his neck. He has to fix that. All that going on and just the growth around it, just the revenue growth. So if you look at all that, it's quite a, quite a dance, right, to, to, to step through that. Um, so you got to give him props on that. And, you know, and, and I think there's so many motivated parties. And I don't think he's so much competing with Microsoft because he kind of already won. But Microsoft's going to win, too, because remember, Satya and Nutella hedged his bets. Microsoft wins. And remember, OpenAI does not have a cloud technology. So there's a lot more to do. So I think you know, Sam gets through the knot hold, as you say on this one. He makes that dance. He steps through the tripwires and the landmines. He gets there. And then now he has to look forward to everybody tooling up. AMD is not going to sit around. NVIDIA is going to try to man maximize that. You tweeted that last night, I think, about NVIDIA is highly motivated not to see you know, consolidation and or power get behind one vendor. There was discussion around no one should finance Anthropic and other kind of uh, uh, lean con issues. They'll probably be red flagged by her. So your regulatory pressure, they're trying to do regulatory capture. It's just, it, it's, it really is. We'll see how he dances through. So that, I think, is puts a fine point on what you just said, which is he got through. And the yeah. numbers don't lie. The revenue's there. Um, it's generational in the use case and the user experience. And what's not being talked about is the role of voice, right? So they just launched the voice uh, APIs. Google's got this notebook LM uh, product. So you're going to start to see the role of video and voice become very important. Again, back to multimodal. So on the tech side, so much still going on. But that's that's we could do a whole pod just on that piece. But going back to the um, open AI funding, I will say, Dave, that this valuation surpasses every VC backed IPO. OK, so if you look at the forget the private rounds, we're talking about IPO valuations. So they did the six point six at one hundred and fifty seven billion dollar valuation. Put the debt aside. Maybe they get an extra four billion in debt to do some things, chip development, whatever. But um uh, if the chat GPT era comes in, look at the numbers. Uber went public around 83 billion. Coinbase, almost 85 billion. Facebook, 104 billion. Alibaba, um, the American version of Alibaba, a decade ago went public at 168 billion. Okay, so you have, you know, th this whole influence from Saudi Arabia, oil, money. This is tons of money. And then um, another couple of ones to throw around from a valuation standpoint, going back a, a generation, Google, $23 billion at the time of the IPO. Apple, $1.8 billion in 1980. NVIDIA, $626 million. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> NVIDIA, million. Okay, million. Not billion, million. NVIDIA, 1980. Again, that's 1980. And then my, obviously Microsoft in 1999, $350 million. I mean, sorry. NVIDIA was 1999. Microsoft was 86. Microsoft's $350 million, million dollar valuation in 86. Again, so that's 86. We're in 2004. So the, the, the thesis of these investors is they believe that this will be a similar um, era of, of valuation and dominance that they saw Google rise in. So Google was a also ran search. Yahoo was the king of, of the mountain at the time. Um, and they were toppled. Um, I don't necessarily buy that the, that the environment's the same. So I'm I'm not of agreement with Brad Gerster on this, and that he thinks that it, you know Google is the is the is the comparable to with Yahoo as a uh, a generational toppling over the the old guard leader. Now at the time Yahoo was the number one search engine, Google had the best algorithmic search, and because of that they became the number one search engine, and they were by far the best technological. 
So when you look at today's market, they have to continue dominating. OpenAI has to keep the trajectory. And that's the question on the table. Is this a good investment? Um, you mentioned before we came on the podcast that Bill Gurley was, um, thought this was a bubble deal. Okay. So that's the question. You know, on paper, if you're an investor like Brad Gerster and these guys who play the cards on the table, you got to play the card because ChatGPT is better than anything else out there. It's just not by the numbers, just on valuation, just on what they're doing, passes to a billion in revenue. So they, they beat Google, they beat Facebook to that one. But they're going into a fiercely competitive environment where the user experience that shifts the voice and these other embedded AI interfaces doesn't give them an advantage at that level. So the question is, it's popular today with kids and everyone using ChatGPT, but will OpenAI be dominant given the competition? Amazon's not going to stand still. Yahoo was not, a, Yahoo was, was like basically still water. They weren't doing anything. And they were also structurally toppable. They could be toppled over because they had run by media people. They weren't run by techies. Sergey Brin's in the office every day. Andy Jack is pulling people in the office five days a week. You got Microsoft's got a hedge both on the financial side as well as upside in the cloud with OpenAI. OpenAI has no cloud. And if if things continue to happen at the application layer with, uh, with generative AI and the user experience shifts, if there's any sentiment like fashion, Right? You go from the 70s to the 80s, you know, disco to punk rock. I mean, that's is what we're talking about here. This is a risk, you know. Well, so, so that's uh, that, that's the way I see it. So I think you know, hey, good job, Gerster and the team. But you know, you're playing cards, and you don't even know what cards are going to come out. So I think you know, to me, the vision of investors isn't the proxy for who's going to win. So this is the conversation that I wanted to have because it's like, you know, okay. Gersh has got a great track record. He's a great investor. I love what he says, too, by the way. I agree with like three quarters of everything he says. But I'm not buying the the open AI is the winning win, winner take all at all. Well, I, I don't well, buy it. Well, I, I mean, here's the thing is, I mean, they've, everybody wanted to get in on this round. But I, I forgot to mention one thing. Just I want to comment on many of the things you said here. Sam Alvin's net, net worth evidently has gone up by about $10 billion. Got to mention that since he's getting a big chunk of stock. Remember, when in front of Congress, he was like, "Well, I don't own any stock." Well, he does now, and so <laughs> he's, he's just, and then the other thing I, you know, you mentioned. I see. I think the big winner in all this is Nvidia still, and yeah. and you, you remember well when Intel was the dominant player, and even when the cloud came out, you know, Intel wanted balance they wanted multiple pc manufacturers they wanted multiple server manufacturers they wanted multiple cloud vendors because they wanted a balanced market they wanted to have the monopoly and right now i think jensen's in that position and so to your point about open ai and winner take all the cogs model the cost of goods sold model and the economic model for llms is very unclear right now they don't have a cloud they they got to spend so much money on NVIDIA GPUs. So how will that affect the economics? And what do the economics look like? When you think about Google search, they had their own cloud, they built their own, you know, IP, obviously, you were able to scale that and their marginal economics were very much like software, perhaps even better. And so what are the marginal economics of LLMs right now? It's very unclear what that business model looks like. I mean, you're talking about, you know, nice big revenue from subscriptions, you know, a couple billion, two, $3 billion from uh, uh, subscriptions and some other, you know, revenue from enterprises and things like that, you know, but they're losing what, $5 billion a year. And they're hoping to be a 10 plus billion dollar company within a couple of years. Okay. What does that look like? Uh, it's very unclear to me, John. Yeah. Um, and, and Gurley, to your point, you know, he basically said, Hey, in my experience, these things, you know, backfire. And I think he was talking about, you know, both, both, as you point out the bubble, but also, yeah. you know, trying to restrict investors from investing in other areas. And so, you know, investors, as you well know, John, have a lot of ways, a lot of channels they can invest too. They could, you know, they could get yeah. their own like political packs, right? They can figure out ways to I mean, invest in. I mean, they're, they're bets. I mean, as, as you know, Dave, they're bets, right? So Gersh is making a good bet here. I don't fault them for that. In fact, I agree with his thesis that, you know, um, that Yahoo was toppled by Google. I just don't, I think structurally it's different. I disagree on that point. But I then asked um, um, Matt Michael McLean from Madrona, so who's Yahoo in this equation? Is it Google or Apple or Amazon? 
So remember, on the web, you had large monolithic infrastructure. Now you got cloud in the game. So OpenAI doesn't have a cloud. So to me, for them to be successful, to be a trillion dollar in valuation, a trillion dollar in revenue, they have to get their own cloud because they can't be um, subservient to an existing cloud. Uh, and that then brings the question of the cost. So the thing that's happening right now in most of the AI startups and the ecosystem is this. Cost overruns are are going to hit a tipping point where you cannot pull back the cost um, uh, running away from you from revenue expansion. So at some point, there has to be a crossover between revenue and cost. So costs are going up. You got Revenue's got to go up faster than the costs. If that doesn't tick in, then it's, it's a losing proposition. So the, then the question comes in, okay, what does that mean? That means that um, NVIDIA, to your point about them being a major player and others, have to kick in the Moore's Law-like uh, um, vibe, which is they have to create better processing power and get operating leverage with technology so that OpenAI can reduce their CapEx and OpEx costs, clearly. That is plausible in the investment thesis. So I think, one, uh, Gerster and the investors are right on you have to assume cost reduction in, and price performance on, on technology will increase. And then, so that's one, I can see that. And two, um, this is a very nuanced point, but I'll bring it up because I think it's relevant. I think Google and Apple are ones that might not be able to, to adjust. So his metaphor with Yahoo is really much about, um, they, didn't, they didn't move fast enough. Google, Google does billions and billions of dollars in profit from search. Okay, so they have to essentially cannibalize their own business right now to compete against open AI. That is the classic definition of innovators dilemma. So if you go look up the innovators dilemma, okay, that is classic it. That is so Google is an innovators dilemma because they got billions. Apple, not so much innovators dilemma because all they got to do is add AI onto it. And then the question is where they get the AI from. They try to do a deal with open AI. They did not participate in the financing. They were rumored to have been in the running. So you got Apple, you got Google, and then you got Meta. Remember, we said on the pod here months ago that Meta could be the next AWS. Well, guess what? They're looking really good right now. Or Meta it looks really strong uh, in this next wave. So the question is, does AWS under Matt Garman maintain that? That's why I was in Seattle trying to get some uh, insight into what's going on at reInvent. Because don't count out Amazon. Because at the end of the day, you need cloud for this, too. You need data centers and cloud. Where are you going to put those GPUs today? And does Amazon come out with custom silicon? So there will be a major second wave of infrastructure innovation coming. No doubt in my mind. It has to happen because the cost overruns right now to fund these open AI applications and, and AI um, large data training, inference, reinforced learning, all the progressions that are happening need horsepower. OK, so if that doesn't come home, the bet crashes. So I think the bubble behavior aside, things have to happen in order for this wave to be profitable. And that is the old school, you know, red line, black line, the revenue's got to go up and the cost got to reduce, build the product better at a lower cost. And that's just old school business 101. So, you know, open AI is dropping so much cash. NVIDIA is going to be the arms dealer. AMD will try to get a piece of that. They're ramping up. So the, that's the question. And then, of course, Broadcom makes money on this, too, because they're selling custom silicon to this next wave. So does Amazon go custom silicon? They go outside. They bring it in. Is it integrated? So all these things are on the table, Dave. This is this is where I see the difference between the wheat from the shaft going on, where you're starting to see the winners and the losers. And that's going to come down to who runs out of money. I'm glad you brought right? up Broadcom. Glad you brought up Broadcom because to me, NVIDIA is the very clear winner here. And Broadcom is, is to me the number two AI play, even though, as Charlie Kawas told us, I mean, it was never really our intent to just go after AI. We went after the interconnectivity between all these XPUs. And of course, I think because they have so much inside baseball at Meta, and Google, and now ByteDance, they have really good, clear visibility on what AI needs look like, but they are the other really big player. The other ones too are the high, bem high bandwidth memory manufacturers like Micron, SK Hynix. I think they're big winners here. And I think, you know, eventually AI could drag along a lot of, you know, other you know, beneficial areas like servers for Dell and HPE and Supermicro and also the storage players. So 
you know, I think the infrastructure, this isn't picks and shovels play right now. And I think it's, it's, it's going to be that way for quite some time. But to your other point, do you remember, I mean, people I think will remember the Martin Casado and Sarah Wong uh, post that they made, the epic post from Andreessen Horowitz, the A16Z, on the trillion dollar paradox, which was basically their argument was that SaaS companies have basically an anchor around their neck, which is the, the cogs, the cost of goods sold for cloud. Now, I never really bought into that um, in terms of it that alone dramatically changing the, the dynamics of SaaS. The, the, the marginal economics of SaaS are not as good as, you know, when you're doing it on-prem on your own, like Microsoft used to, the cost would go down to what it cost for them to, you know, write code on a floppy disk. There was nothing in sense. And so obviously cloud cost more, but so SaaS companies running at 75 you know, to 80% gross margins is just fine. Their cash flow is good. So I never really thought that that would dramatically change the dynamic. But now we're talking about something completely different. You have massive cogs with GPUs and you have cloud costs. Now, can they push those cloud costs onto the consumer? You know, maybe, but they've still got a lot of development costs there. So it's very unclear to me what the killer business model is. And maybe they've thought about it, or maybe they're just going to try to figure it out as they go along. I mean, that's kind of this Silicon Valley way, isn't it, John? It's just, you know, get a massive number of eyeballs, get the first mover advantage, raise a ton of dough and figure it out. I just, it's not obvious to me what figuring it out means. Well, I think OpenAI has definitely figured it out. One, and they have a better product right now. People are using it, the adoption, and Gerster's mind, mind share argument is legit, but it's because they have good technology right now. And they have the better product. So uh, ChatGPT has been opening eyes, captured the minds of hearts of people as a generational shift. But remember, so did Netscape, and Netscape was killed. So what's going to be interesting to see is, is that does the user experience of ChatGPT create a halo effect for them to build sustainable moats and competitive advantage over time and build a sustainable, durable business? And obviously, it's it's funded in a way to create more of a barriers to entry because funding does do that. But at the end of the day, as the product will determine. And I bring up the fashion argument because like fashion, when things change, um, whether it's watches or clothing, people's sentiment shifts. So the, the research here would point to uh, an area we will explore, which is whether it's an AI PC or how data centers are going to be crafted or how people view application development, whether you're a startup or an entrepreneur, what's the mindset of the user base, both consumer and builders? So in the enterprise, you can't just throw AI at the enterprise because AI, AI in the enterprise requires domain expertise in how enterprises work. Little things like these databases have these settings for these people. You can't just throw AI at that and learn it. You got to build that in. That's going to take some serious um, domain expertise. That's where the value is on the enterprise side. Consumer side is this is better than search. ChatGPT and and these some of these AI tools like Perplexity, even to some extent our CubeAI.com in our little domain, is better search with RAG and AI and retrieving than anything else. And so clearly Google's got to be scared. And that's why Gersh's point about the cannibalization is legit. And his point is. He doesn't, the bet is, I don't think that they're going to change because Google would have to lay on the side of the road billions of dollars in profit to go after OpenAI. That is a complete innovator shift. The dilemma is, do we, how, when do, how do we take down and cannibalize our existing stuff ourselves for the competitors do it? Do we eat our own or does the competitor eat, our, eat us? That's the dilemma. And that's what Google faces. Apple, again, as I said, not so much. Google is the one that I'm looking at right now and saying they're the ones who have the best chance to compete and beat open AI. No doubt you know, about it. Um, the question Frank, is, will they? <laughs> and if history Frank, is any lesson, it'll be a no. Well, unless Sergey comes in and says, you know what, we're going to leave it on the table. And then how do the investors react to that at Google? Well, that's a good I mean, point. It's, what's oh, the market going to do? There's a market, I mean, market won't like it, obviously, but they might say, damn the torpedoes because they get enough cash to do that. But I want to go back to something you said. Frank Slootman, when he was scaling service now and Snowflake, used the term, the phrase, he said, inherent profitability. And what he meant by that is when people would ask him, well, you know, you're growing fast, but you're not making any money. He said, look, if we wanted to make money, we could dial down our growth and throw cash off. 
we, we can do that, but we want to scale. We want to get to a point because we know at that certain scale, we have operating leverage to your earlier point. And so Snowflake, of course, today is, you know, fighting some other changes. They're basically fighting a fashion change, right? It's, it's the 70s gone into 80s. Uh, so putting that aside for a moment, uh, they still have that inherent profitability. It's not clear to me that OpenAI has that inherent profitability because of the expenses of of, of having to buy all those GPUs. And I, I don't, I'm not sure what their cloud costs look like, but I'm sure there are some there. And of course, the staff costs, they can get operating leverage from the staff cost, no doubt. You don't have to, I mean, they don't have to scale staff with as they scale revenues, but they do have to presumably continue to spend numerous, enormous amounts of their cost of goods sold on infrastructure. And so, you know, it's very unclear to me, again, what that looks like, you know, at scale, at a steady state. And I just want to make a comment about RAG. There was an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal today, extensively quoted that uh, the AI lead from uh, from IDC, I've not met, but I hear she's pretty sharp. Anyway, they were basically saying, you know, RAG's nice, but it's, it's not that good. So to get beyond RAG, you got to do training, you got to do fine tuning, and you got to do your own internal custom training. And that's expensive as hell. And most organizations you know, aren't in a position to do that. Or if they are, they're going to yeah. have to spend a lot of money. And the latest ETR survey shows that most customers spend less than a half a million dollars a year on AI. And that's not a lot of money. I mean, you know, we probably spend that on AI. So we're a small company. And so it was an interesting stat of about, you know, we're talking about 1,700 um, IT decision makers that they sampled. And the, like around 40% were spend, spending less than a million bucks. To, to the less than 30% were spending more than a million. So that was kind of an interesting stat to me. Now, I'm sure there's some big companies out there, the big drug companies and the financial services companies that are spending, you know, gobs of money, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. But most organizations just aren't in a position to really drive that AI. So, so this is maybe where open AI, you know, can, can drive some value. In other words, if they can make it so that out of the box, I can get better, whether it's better rag or just better results. But right now, you know, LLM results, when you apply them to your own business, they're not that great. They're okay, but they're pretty generic. And so, you know, if, if open AI can build that into their product, because I do agree, John, they have the best product. Um, then maybe there's an economic model there. And, you know, that probably is. I mean, if I were if I were Gerstner and I were one of those investors, I'd take the bet. If I could have got into that round for, you know, order of a billion, half a billion, you know, had the cash, I 100% would want to be in there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a legit bet. I mean, but I don't agree. I, he's, I think, you know, again, this is when investors who, who don't have vision, who do great research. And Gerstner doesn't really have vision. He's an investor, okay? He's got vision as an investor, but investors aren't entrepreneurs, right? So, he, although he's been an entrepreneur, um, but he's a card player. And so the cards are good. I'd make the bet if I was him too, because what does he have to lose? He makes bets all the time. He made bet on Snowflake at one. He made a bet on Hop and Event Platform. That didn't go well, right? So, so you know, he's a game of winners and losers. So that's what he does. And he does now, great research. He does He does great research. His dude, their research is, research. no, Alternative is awesome. I, yeah. I, again, I, like I love the guy. He's awesome. Love his motivation. And I'm optimistic because I, like he's not wrong about the web either, but there's a little bit structural difference between the web and now. And, and hyperscalers are in the mix and not everybody's Yahoo, right? So that that's where he's flawed, in my opinion. Now, where he's right is um, his thesis. Now, I'll add to my my opinion to his thesis if I was in the room. What's with his him, thesis? Say, Can you just frame that? Can you just frame it for the audience? His thesis is- You were at the Madrona conference and he was speaking there, right? So yeah, he spoke there and he gave a lot of color commentary. And what was that uh, conference about? about what, what was that conference about? I mean, Madrone is awesome. Uh, I, I presume you saw Soma. Yeah, and our, all the team our tribe there. was there. Matt was there. Uh, Gerster was there. Uh, you know, I I don't know him well. I've never worked with him, so I just know of him and the team. And his his uh, partner is a young um, rising star, Jamin Ball. He's the son of Ben Ball, who I coached little league with. Uh, great. He runs Francisco Partners. Um, he's a great, um, but he's got a great blog called Cloud of Judgment. Um, they do great research and they're good at what they do, but they do something. I love their model. They have, a, they invest in public companies and private companies. And what he said at the event, which was celebrating the IA40, the Intelligent Applications 40, it's fourth year, third year as an event summit. Um, I was there, uh, everyone was there. It was the, pretty much the cloud tribe. And it was Silicon Valley and Seattle kind of tribe together. 
kind of our core audience uh, at the high end. Um, and his thesis is this. OpenAI has captured the minds of everybody. Their product is magic. It's working. Everybody's using it. And that mind share is inimitable. And I agree with him. So, so he's right on that. The question is, is it sustainable? Okay. And how inimitable is it from a copying perspective? So I think it could be copied, but his thesis, second piece of his thesis is that he doesn't think anyone will be able to, meaning Google specifically, because Google would have to cannibalize billions and billions of dollars of profit, which they will never do in his mind. That's my words. He didn't say never. I think never, because I think it's hard for Google to do that pivot. I think there are wild cards. There's Amazon, there's Meta, and maybe even Apple that have different cannibalization options. They don't have to cannibalize as much as Google. So on that thesis alone, the bet is sound. Okay, And it's a good bet because they're clearly winning. And they have to continue to deliver the magic. He also brought up the voice-to-voice -voice piece, which I thought was very smart because that's the next killer app. Okay, Not just text, language, with text writing stuff. Multimodal and specifically voice will change the game. I was playing with it last night. It is phenomenally impressive. It's riveting. You can do... You can create podcasts, how to's. It's just, it's a step function user experience benefit. And that's his thesis. And he believes, rightfully so, that that makes it a good investment. So I agree with him on that. I just don't think it's going to be as easy and it's not a layup. Okay. Uh, some investments are a no brainer. They got such great lead. You can look at the lead and saying the competition is X, Y, and Z. They would have to do A, B, and C. To meet that here, it's different. You have a little bit of ABC to change, but the players are have muscle. And again, my thing is that OpenAI does not have a cloud, okay? And so right now, as OpenAI spends all that money to continue their lead, the, the can they produce the revenue? Now, his argument there is, and it's a good one, they're the fastest to a billion than Facebook and Google. So we're living in a whole other world. And I think that's where I think he's a good card player on this one because his bet is, will anyone catch up? I think that's a good bet. Again, I'm, I'm not 100% agreeing with the, the, the thesis that there are some potential wild cards. I will say that, um, like the web, uh, since he uses that metaphor, his thesis is also sound in the area that all the naysayers on the web were like, oh, the websites load so fast. Dial up is too slow. This, um, people can't find what they're looking for. And so that, to me, was the key piece. Can the web do, um, can the web technology, and it did, meet those concerns? And the answer was yes. And I think to your point about NVIDIA, you'll see technology do that. Yeah, I think about, yeah. I think about the companies that didn't make it through, and it took a long time to see that, and then did make it through in the case of Microsoft. But so you saw that Microsoft sort of became, even though they were very profitable, kind of became irrelevant in terms of innovation under Balmer when they were, you know, doing Windows phones and things like that. No, no, the DO, it was the DOJ, Dave. Remember the DOJ? Yeah, screw yeah. I, I, yes and no. I, I would, I disagree with that, John. I think that Microsoft's wounds were much more self-inflicted than the DOJ. Had the, had the DOJ not um, tried to put a, you know, a, a, lock them up and, and, you know, tie their hands, I think they still would have screwed up because they were just hugging on to Windows and they really weren't leaning into the cloud until Satya came along. So they kind of under bomb. Well, no, you're, you're you skipped you, you, you skipped a couple things. So I would I, I would disagree with you. When the DOJ distracted Microsoft, they already had MSN. They had dial up. They had search. Um, they were powering all advertising keywords before Google even adopted AdWords before they turned on the revenue model. So Microsoft had all not only deals, they had position in powering 70% of the web traffic at that time. Google's algorithmic search uh, made them get the Yahoo deal, AOL deal, and a bunch of other deals that Gerster points out. So I think Microsoft was asleep at the switch. That's a combination of incompetence, distraction, self-inflicted wounds. That's his argument for today. He thinks that Google will be Microsoft. Um, he thinks that Google won't catch up. And again, like I said, if you think about the naysayers during the web generation, the, the objections of, for the big financings at that time, small in comparison, but if you factor in growth and the capital markets and the overall you know, growth of the uh, S&P and the, the Dow and just the international money, 
they're kind of comparable because all the objections around the bubble, dot-com bubble and the web were managed by better processing, faster internet, more online population growth. All those things mattered because there were people using it. That's Gerster and the investor's thesis with OpenAI, that the user base will continue to use OpenAI. They will continue to see innovations that are bottlenecks today in costs, like getting GPUs from NVIDIA, because now you have potentially alternative sources. So I think there's a really strong argument that that will be a factor. If it doesn't, it'll hurt that. Now, the wild card in this, the dark horse, is the clouds. So if you're open AI, your entire bet is based upon not just the interface, usability, uh, performance, and infrastructure. If Amazon, if they have to pay all that cash to say AWS, Google, or Microsoft, whatever clouds they use, or all, they'll probably end up using all of them, they're not going to be in a competitive advantage position. And then they have a risk that the user interface piece is commoditized. So there's a lot of, I would say, potential trap doors for OpenAI. Uh, okay, again, so I'm not trying to be negative on OpenAI. I like the, the bet, but there's still stuff going on around the corner. It's not the straight and narrow gas at 90 miles an hour. It's still do the pat the Sam Altman dance through competitive forces and right, costs. So, so I want to come back to, um, and just if you'll indulge me, just to make finish the thought there, which was so it sounds like you agree that the DOJ was less of a factor on Microsoft. It was more hubris and market forces, and you know them just sort of taking their eye off the ball. Uh, I would. Well, I worked with Microsoft at that time. I know for a fact it was a major distraction. So it was a material piece. I'm not saying it wasn't a distraction. It was a distraction for Microsoft for sure. And it was a distraction for IBM back in the day with the DOJ. They were very cognizant mm -hmm. of and had to be careful. But that that is not what led to their Hold on, decision. hold on, hold on. Let's, let's, let, gotta, let me unpack gotta, that with you. Before you go to the next point, because this is important, your, heart, your entire argument about Lena Khan, okay, comes full circle here. One of the complaints that the industry is having that support the anti-Lena Khan rhetoric is the fact that M&As and IPOs are struggling. Would you agree that you know there's a lot of pressure? So if you go back to that time when Microsoft, I would say I would say M&A is on Lena Khan. I, I, I don't think IPOs are necessarily. Yeah. So so go it? back go go back to 1999, 2000, 2001 timeframe pre dot com bubble bursting. Okay, if Microsoft was acquisitive, they could have rolled up a bunch of companies, and they didn't. So, you know, there's, there's an argument there that that was uh, an inorganic growth strategy for Microsoft on top of the fact that they already had a position uh, at that time. They controlled pretty much 70% of the web traffic uh, at that time. That's incredible. And the, and Google was just had Yahoo and um, a deal with uh, AOL. And I think they had Apple, a little bit of Apple, but Safari wasn't driving a lot of traffic. So you can look at that and say, Okay, that was a moment in time, missed opportunity. And I think that's a direct result of the Lena Khan dynamic or regulatory oversight. So when you have an M&A market that doesn't allow someone to actually innovate, then the winners run, run the table. So that's what happened with Google, in my opinion. So Google ended up taking advantage of that on the search side, on the internet side, and the fact that all the other search engines were inferior products. That is Gerster's main argument, that the superiority of OpenAI does that. So again, that, that's a little bit of a fine point Dave, nuance, but had Microsoft made some acquisitions, they probably could have rolled up the search engine business and then bolted on what was at that time two companies, real names that I worked at, and goto.com, which was doing paid keywords. So um, there's a scenario where Microsoft wins it all and Google becomes part of just another company. Okay. So again, I, I would ask you to indulge me just for a moment because the thesis, if I understand it, is that Google is going to face the innovators dilemma because they can't kill their own business. And what I was, what, what I, what I still strongly believe, and nothing you just said changed my mind, is that the, the consent decree with the Department of Justice had nothing to do with what you just said. It was all about Windows and it was all about bundling Internet Explorer. And what, what the DOJ did is they found that Microsoft was, was behaving like a monopoly and using its monopoly power and what the, the consent decree with the DOJ back in the 90s limited Microsoft's exclusionary practices. They required Microsoft to make Windows interoperable with non-Microsoft software. Uh, they 
forced Microsoft to change its licensing terms, and the decree, you know, just restricted the scope of non-disclosures that Microsoft could negotiate with independent software vendors because the NDAs tied their hands. And so, so none of that had to do anything with Google's business. I think personally, Microsoft just missed it because they were hanging on, they were hugging on to Windows until Satya came along and then realized the cloud was the play. So I think Obama just lacked vision. Um, I think, you know, he had made billions and just said, hey, we can ride this thing out. And by the way, he wasn't wrong. They did ride it out and it threw off enough cash and gave Satya enough time to turn the company around. But here's the point I wanted to make. I, I, again, I always say that market forces are a much better adjudicator of monopolies um, than broad government intervention. I, I'm a fan of narrow government, government intervention. And I think what Microsoft did with the DOJ or DOJ did with Microsoft was fine. You know, limit that, that bundling. What, Microsoft, what the DOJ did with IBM, which was it forced it to open up its APIs to third, third party software vendors and plug compatible manufacturers like storage tech and, and other tape manufacturers and, and printer manufacturers. That was a good thing for the market, but those are very narrow remedies not broad break up companies. Now, the point I wanted to make was that both Microsoft and Intel, in my opinion, missed the next wave. And Google, you know, they may fumble and they may poorly execute, but they are heavily invested in AI. They've got significant AI chops. They were perhaps arguably the leader in AI before OpenAI came along. And, you know, very clearly they're making some, some execution mistakes. I. I I, the question is, is it related to their concern about the innovator's dilemma, or will they be able to transition their business successfully? So I think it's a different dynamic. I don't think past is prologue here. And I think Google actually has a really good shot of migrating its existing, call, call it legacy ad business. And this is something you know a lot more about than I do. But transitioning that business to an AI-powered business, I think you're seeing it every day when you do a Google search and and I think they're injecting, infusing AI into their platform. It's not unlike Intel, which chose not to participate in smartphones, and Microsoft, which chose not to participate aggressively in the cloud until Satya came along and you saw the results. I feel like Google will and is aggressively participating in the next wave. And that's my, my argument. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I think that there's layers to this, right? So, you know, I don't think people come into Google and saying, hey, we have the innovative dilemma, we have to change and pivot or change trajectory. I think it's just a, the frog in boiling water, right? You know, the old uh, expression, you throw a frog in boiling water, it jumps out. Well, if it's in the water and it boils, they're, they're dead. So, you know, I think Google is going to have that challenge. Um, Sergey is coming into the office every day. That was on the record. He did that at the All-In Summit. Um, I know Amazon is actually paddling as fast as they can to ride this wave. Um, others are as well. So I think there's other forces. And I think the, the jury's still out on the product-led growth opportunity, which you're kind of pointing out, which is if there, the product value changes, okay, and the process behind it, and say the enterprise and even the consumer, as we have AI PCs coming, which is the PC and the device all together as one thing, you're starting to see major shifts still happening. It's the same one shift. It's not one secular shift. It's a series of big shifts. So I think the scenario for Google and others would be if the goalposts shift on the product value, OpenAI has to keep up and Google can slingshot into a position to change the game, right? And that's what they would be doing. I think that's what I see them doing. For instance, this uh, notebook LM stuff is phenomenal. Uh, it's early. But it just point out that voice is a killer app, not just search. And so that's one. So that then, then the question is how 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 um, much they adopt your philosophy of damn the torpedoes. That's called, you know, fortitude, right? Can they stomach and stomach the long game move to saying we will lay down profits in the short term, cannibalize our own existing business we know which will decline over time, or do we milk that at uh and, and then get back in the game yeah. and that that's that's the decision they have to make because they, they wait too long yep. they miss the window and i think right now what, what open ai is doing is super smart and this is what why gerster was so much banging the table on this point and he's not wrong is that he thinks and his bet is based that they won't apple's too far behind technically and this is where i think what we don't what we don't know about what they're doing on the investor side what research do they have so putting the vision comment aside 
Um, I don't think he has the vision. I don't think investors are a proxy for what's going on in the marketplace. I think they do good, great research. But at the same time, you know, he's got enough research and vision to know that Apple may not have the, the goods. Google has the goods, but their pivot or change won't happen. So I think those are big bet inputs. Okay. So let me ask you. Let me I, ask I would. I would questions. make the same. I would make. I would. If I was his shoes, I would make the same bet. Now, Altimeter, as a company, has something that nobody else has, and he pointed this out in the, at the event. If you invested in Nvidia in, in, in 1999 at the 260 million and held the stock, you did great. But if you were an investor in the public markets and came in just in the past couple of years, you made out just as much as the IPO winners, meaning the VCs. So his point is, you can make money in the public markets and private, and that's what Altimeter does. It's a dual model flywheel, early stage and growth companies and the public markets. That's smart. And his point was, if you look at the returns on those VCs I mentioned earlier, Google and the ones Uber and went public, the investors who captured the value on on their on their on their investment on the private side was a number. His point was, you could have made the same number if you were just doing later stage rounds and IPO uh, in the public markets. And he's not and he's not wrong on that either. The math doesn't doesn't lie, right? So his point is, I'll jump in here because I think this is an IPO moment in the capital markets. And he's uniquely positioned from his being a founder of that venture, the investment venture. I think he's smart. He's saying, hey, whether you call it an IPO or not, it's basically an IPO from a valuation standpoint. I'm going to capture it because I captured the NVIDIA, I captured the Snowflake, I captured all those other public companies. And he's right, right? I mean, he's not wrong. It's just your investment thesis. He's, you invest and you make money. He, he's a sharp investor, and I really like the way he frames his framework. He's data driven, and he uses probabilities. And, he, and he's like you said, he's a poker player. But let me come back to something. I want to ask you some direct. And and, and one and one point on but just to finish the point, Gurley, his partner on the podcast, he's a purist VC. So of course he's like, damn, that's the wrong strategy. Of course that's he's a purist. Yeah. Purist VC yeah. is ah, oh, we do early stage. That's what he knows. He rinses and repeats that model all right. the time. Gersh is a little bit a of a hybrid. Let me ask you a question. What is a open AI's moat? Go. Open AI's moat right now is the fact that they have a uh, mind share and acceleration with the audience, their products being used, and that is really, really valuable. Number one. Their moat is the fact that they have technology that's relevant to the user experience magic that they have. And that's one, the chat GPT moment two years ago, things like voice today other things. They're doing really, really good job. And the price of their API per token, per million token is dropping. So you're seeing kind of a uh, a Moore's Law-like flywheel where the reducing costs and increasing capability is the classic price performance. We saw Intel do that with their processors. So, so that's happening on the token side. On the infrastructure side, NVIDIA and others are bringing in there. So that's going to help their mode get better. So their mode is scale on users, mind share of users, and and their their next moat that they don't have that they should be doing is getting proprietary infrastructure, so they don't have to pay the cloud guys for the big iron that they need, and that's the cost, the main cost right now. Okay, so okay, so I agree with that. Uh, I totally agree with their their operating leverage improves with volume. Um, I think even if they have uh, their own private infrastructure, they still got to pay Nvidia until until somebody topples Nvidia. In the GPU game, I'm 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 a firm believer that Nvidia has the monopoly, and you're going to have to pay the piper if you want to have the best product, the yeah. best AI product. Now, the corollary question that I want to ask you, which is Peter Thiel's sort of theory, is you want to have a monopoly. That's the company you want to invest in. Will those factors that you just talked about, which again I agree with, um, mm -hmm. the 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 moat that OpenAI has, will that lead, in your opinion, to an OpenAI? monopoly why or why not it's a good question i mean if there's an, it's a scenario based question right so uh, let's take um, scenario one um they continue to thunder along with the value they have now which the investors are investing in and they continue to win the consumer game that means more product enhancements around productivity and security the things that are uh, going to be in line with some of the governance things again the sam altman dance through the through the tripwires and the landmines he does that on the consumer side. He continues to go. The upside potential here is enterprise. And the enterprise game is different. However, NVIDIA is also playing in the enterprise game. So if, if NVIDIA and OpenAI can create a symbiotic synergy relationship where 
they can take that advantage on the performance side, like I just mentioned, and move it to the enterprise. Open AI becomes programmable. Okay. And that's why I think Amazon's taking notice more than Apple on this front. Google should be, but not sure they are seeing it yet. Um, but clearly Amazon does. Uh, Amazon invested in and they've captured the enterprise and the startups. They're making startups more important again. So the enterprise is the upside. If they get the enterprise with NVIDIA, and NVIDIA, remember, NVIDIA is NIMS, the NVIDIA um, inference microservices model that Vast Data did, just did a deal with in their Insight Engine, among others. They can get into the enterprise and become part of that fabric. Again, that's where productivity and security are also playing. So productivity and security are the two killer apps besides search and retrieval and voice interaction I mentioned earlier. Those They do those two things. It's checkmate. Okay. Because the enterprise gets the lock spec. Okay. Scenario so, two is the enterprise play by NVIDIA, NIMS, and others doesn't hold water because there's competition there and domain expertise. It's it's not as easy to implement. It's awkward. It requires workflow end-to-end -end management. If that doesn't come home, then they're going to fight a battle, frontal battle on the battlefield on consumer, of which everyone's gunning for them. That's trying to compete for that leadership position. Okay. So you, it's a winner take most in that scenario, not winner take all. So no monopoly you, in that scenario. So third question then, great analysis. Third question of the scenarios. Third question is, do you agree that of all the players out there, Anthropics and Mistral's and even AWS, that Google is in the best position right now anyway, to challenge OpenAI's moat that you so well described earlier. Do you agree with that? That Google is is the one that we should be looking at as the the, the the challenger, the second favorite, if you will. Yeah. So okay. I think so, Google Google, I think Google, yes, because again, and I think the scenario B will probably happen, no monopoly, but rising tide, winner categorically, top five people will become leaders. And Google is hitting developers right now that are in the age in their 20s. They were in middle school using Google Docs. And so I think Google and has the large scale. And I think with Google Cloud, they're making those moves. Uh, to build an ecosystem, their marketplace is exploding in revenue. Google could be that arms dealer cloud play uh, for them, but they have to get their GPUs up too. And I don't think they have the capacity um, yet. And I think they'll probably figure it out just like Amazon is. Well, but so this is where I think Jassy's, you know, there is no compression algorithm for experience. It totally applies in AI. And that's why everybody's going crazy and spending like nuts on AI. So I agree with you that Google, I mean, obviously I agree that Google is the you know second favorite here. And I would say three things. They have the AI chops, they have the private infrastructure and they have the volume. So to me, it comes down to Google's, you used a really good word before, fortitude. Do they have the fortitude and the execution ethos to challenge uh, open AI's moat? And I would bet Yes, over the long term, over over a five to ten year period, I would bet that it's winner takes a lot. I think number one and number two and even number three can do very very well in this market. I think it's very cloud like in that sense. One and two do, do the best, um, and we'll see uh, what the impact is yeah. of open open source. Open source could have a huge factor here in in affecting. Um, particularly the third party players, but also open AI. I think that is another wild card. And um, uh, I, I I think at the end of the day, um, if I were Brad Gerstner, I would be making that bet, but I would be trying to find ways to sprinkle my bets elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if you look at our power law we put out two years ago, right? The power law of AI models, you can almost take that power law and map the companies to it, right? And say, there's opportunity up and down the long tail to the head of the power law where you're going to have the winners on that distribution. I'll tell you why, because you're going to have the consumer and you're going to have the enterprise and everything in between. The fat middle will be the value. So a company like Dell with AIPC, you know, my theory on this, the AIPC is not a PC anymore. It's the PC, it's your devices, it could be your wearable, it's everything. It's your experience to the data. And, and whoever has the data wins. And this is, again, open AI doesn't have all the data. And in fact, I found it I found it ironic at the Madrona conference where everyone was kind of crapping on agent force. And well, hey, man, look at these old guys. They're trying to, of course, it's entrepreneurial crowds. So like, get in the arena, beat Salesforce, create a replica. You know, of course, that's rah rah. Go and you, you, damn the torpedoes. Get in the arena. It's okay if you right. die. We'll fund your next company. <laughs> go, take down the go, go, old go. guard. Go <laughs> take that hill. Um, but Salesforce, I'm different opinion on this. I think Salesforce has the data. And their problem prior to Gen AI was they couldn't get it to work together. So I think the enterprise 
uh, is an underestimated upside potential in the AI game because unlike the web wave, consumer uh, was way ahead of enterprise. Enterprise lagged by almost a decade in value creation from the consumer wave. So here in the, in our world now with AI and data available, the AI wave uh, the, the, is going to impact the enterprise on a much more accelerated basis. That's why NVIDIA is going in the enterprise because they don't yet have a lot of competition. So the enterprise is not lagging too far behind from the enterprise. That's why the power law makes sense. And so you'll see enterprise adoption and the power source there is the domain expertise of of a company so yeah the the computing revolution that we're living in in this wave is so incredible because it was it that served the business with technology now you have it becoming large scale supercomputing centers with cloud and the value of what it used to provide from an enablement standpoint is shifting to the process people and the domain experts so the new it is all the people who know all the switches and knobs in an enterprise because that's going to be automated away for productivity. So productivity and security are the killer variables in the Gen AI equation on both sides, consumer and enterprise. So you're going to see a shrinking of lagging between enterprise and consumer. And that's where I think AI, AI will have that power law. So if OpenAI wins with NVIDIA in the enterprise, it's monopoly. But then so I don't think... Gonna, that's going to happen because so, Amazon's not going to let them walk right in. And right. Google's nipping at Amazon's heels. And Microsoft owns AI, open AI, and they have a huge position in the enterprise. So the enterprise game, Dave, is like there's a graveyard of companies trying to dominate consumer and enterprise. And it's just, it's just, it's a huge task, uh, even with open AI's momentum. And like you said, Sam's dancing through a lot of, you know, uh, potentially distracting um, corporate structures. Uh, he's dealing with multiple theaters of innovation. Back end, front end, user experience, and then obviously the regulatory um, around the corner. So you know, it's like it's a tall order. Uh, and so I think scenario B is going to be it. You know, top five companies do extremely well on the consumer side. They serve the enterprise in the power law, and you're going to see an integrated environment of of apps. That's my take on that. If I had to make a prediction, that's what. But either way, Gerster and the investors will thrive. Capital and all those other guys, they'll, they'll. I think they'll come home with open AI. I think that'll so, it'll play out, but it won't be it won't be as big as they think. So I I could spend an hour. You mentioned Salesforce. I could spend an hour on Salesforce. I love their strategy. I will just say this: Salesforce has always struggled on doing integration. Now is the time. It has a chance to integrate all those piece parts that it bought. Driving, you know, cent the center of their universe is the data cloud. They're building out the harmonization layer. Um, they're building out an agent control framework. If if you listen to one keynote from Dreamforce, if you can only listen to one, I would listen to, you would be surprised at this, the president and CEO of Tableau. That to me was the one of the most interesting, obviously, um, Benioffs was good too. I would listen to that. But the Tableau one describes, in my opinion, what the future of BI is going to look like, what the future of the application stack is going to look like, how the integration should occur. And, and it's a, it was a great vision that, that that guy laid out. So I would encourage people to yeah. go listen to that. If you want to see what the future is like. But Salesforce, again, they've never been great at doing the integration, but now is their, their opportunity. And I got to go, John. <laughs> Dave. We'll see you later. We got the podcast. We got the family matter. And I love the sunglasses looking pretty cool. New vibe for you. Look at Dave's cool, cool and relevant. I love, I, love I tell you, I love Charleston. It's an amazing city. Never been here. Fantastic. All right. We'll have a great time and uh, we'll see you next time in the podcast. Episode 75. See you next time.